Hello, and welcome to the Diction Police by the Book, our webinar series on lyric diction. I'm your host, Ellen Rissinger, an American vocal coach accompanist currently on the music staff of the Zempelopper in Dresden, Germany. And my partner in crime today is vocal coach Dr. Francois Germain, a native French and German speaker who grew up in Aix-en-Provence and studied French diction with Rosemarie Landry. Francois is assistant professor at the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam and also teaches lyric diction at the University of Ottawa. Thanks for joining us, Francois. Hi, Ellen, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you to talk about one of my favorite topics today. Today's our first lesson on French diction, and right now I'm not seeing that the live broadcast is on, just so you know. As we go through this session, if you, the audience, have any questions, please post them in the comments section of the Hangout, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. Whatever questions we can't get to will work into one of the upcoming episodes in this series. One of the first things we want to make clear is that the study of lyric diction is not meant to replace the study of language. That's right. Uh, the study of language and the study of diction really go hand in hand in my mind. It's not enough to learn the sounds and the rules of diction without having some understanding of how the language works uh, grammatically. Additionally, uh, diction study is really only a tool that's there to help us achieve uh, expressive idiomatic singing within the context of good vocal production. So it is crucial that as we study diction, we also familiarize ourselves with uh, what I call the flavor of the language as it is spoken. The reason we study lyric diction is because singing text is different than just speaking it. In opera or art song, we end up extending vowels that are rarely long in spoken language or having to pronounce consonants that we would normally swallow slightly. So as we go along, we'll also highlight the rules of lyric diction that differ from spoken language or places where we just need to do a little more than we would in daily speech. Precisely. Just as a side note, Francois, it's still on the, on the event page is not posting the live video. It's showing me as live here, so I think, I think we're It's okay. showing me as live here too, but I'm on the page and it's saying this Hangout on Air is hosted by the Diction Police. The live video broadcast will begin soon. It might just be a delay. Three minutes? Wow. Okay. I just wanted to say that. Okay. We'll just go on. The reason we study lyric diction is because singing text... Whoops. Said that already. All right. So let's get started. For the next hour, we'll be focusing primarily on the vowels in French, and there are a lot of them. Well, that is really the, the main difficulty with French, uh, and probably the element that can seem the most daunting at first. French has 18 vowels. Uh, sometimes I actually even count 19, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, 18 vowels compared to only 7 in Italian and 11 in German. So while this certainly adds an element of complexity to the study of diction, I think it also makes French a very singable language. Um, and besides, the, the repertoire is phenomenal, so it's, it's really worth studying. When you say it's singable, what does that mean? Uh, I mean uh, two things by that. Uh, first, French is what we call an open syllable language, which means that each syllable ends in a vowel, except when a word ends in a sound of final consonant. Now, why is that important? Well, because in French, uh, we have to really make sure that we sing on the vowel as long as we can within the musical context and the rhythm set by the composer uh, before moving on to the next syllable. This means that consonants should never be anticipated, and they should always remain light and crisp. So French is not a consonant-driven language. That's also why in, in um, our IPA transcriptions and the examples that we will be using throughout these um, webinars, uh, we separate syllables by always sending final consonants to the beginning of the next syllable, as you can see here in this line from uh, Chanson Triste by Duparc. You can notice that the final R of cœur is stuck to the next syllable at the very beginning of the uh, word d'or. So we don't transcribe this cœur with the K-O-E-R. We just transcribe K-O-E 
and then stick the R to the next syllable. Same thing with Dora and Claire de, to really emphasize this idea that we sing on vowels. Now, the, uh, the other thing that um, I mean by French being a singable language is that since there are more vowel sounds, there is also a greater chance that vowels will live closer together and have more in common between them, which helps uh, tremendously in achieving a sense of line and legato. Exactly. So today, why don't we focus on the vowels that appear in most of the languages that we sing in? Yes, uh, and I think it would be helpful to zero in on pure vowels for this pure lesson. We will cover all the other vowels in our next webinar, just so that we don't uh, try to do too much at once. Um, and I'd like to go, the, to go through those pure vowels in an order that may seem peculiar, but I think will make a lot of sense when we are uh, through with today's episode. So there are two kinds of pure vowels uh, in the way I try to organize them, what I call tongue vowels and what I call lip vowels. So rather than defining tongue vowels and lip vowels right now, why don't we just get to these vowels? Because I think examples will make this a little bit clearer. Our first vowel is the bright A. Ah. Great. So bright A ah in French is pretty much the same as in Italian and German. Uh, it's a very bright vowel. And one of the things that I have to correct the most in coachings is the over-darkening of this vowel. Singers really have to trust that this brighter sound is correct and sounds idiomatic. So to form the bright ah, we keep our lips in a relaxed, neutral position. Our tongue, or the back of the tongue, is flat and low. And the tip of the tongue touches the bottom teeth. And your bright eye will sound like this. Uh, which is very bright. Yes. <laughs> the main difficulty with any language is spelling. And I think it's in French it's doubly so because there are awful lot of spellings where the phonetic sound that's made isn't any of the letters that appear. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, in, in our webinars, uh, we will try and outline to outline most of the common spellings for each sound. And we will also talk about some of the more complicated ones in detail. But uh, we don't want to necessarily be completely exhaustive with all the very rare spellings. So just a, a little side note here. So as far as spellings for our bright A, ah, we can uh, have this sound when the letter A appears not combined with another vowel or not combined with an N or an M. And we can also have the bright A ah when uh, we see the letter A with the accent grave on its own. And just remember that the accent, when you see it, or this particular accent, when you see it over the A, does not change the sound. And the, okay. other, possi the other possibility for a bright A ah is in the combination OE. Oh, yes, exactly. But this, the letter A ah is pretty much what, the letter A, I should say, is what most people expect to get an A ah vowel. So why don't we show some examples of that first? Great. So our first example is taken from Claire de Lune from Fête Galante by Debussy. Les grands jets d'eau svelte parmi les marbres, where we have two very clear, nice, bright A's uh, that appear and uh, on their own, not in combination with uh, the letters around them. And you just go for that bright sound that we described above. And the one thing I really remember from my first French diction teacher was that the A ah before an A ah seems to feel extra bright. Yes, and English speakers particularly need to be uh, careful not to head towards a, an R sound. Uh, I think uh, English natives, when they see the R, they're, they might be tempted to actually color that A ah vowel that precedes with a little bit of an R in there, which would darken the vowel. Um, and the other letter that can actually cause this problem in, uh, with the bright A is L uh, for English speakers as well. The, the, uh, it, because in English, the L is pretty far back in the mouth. Yeah, kind of like the Russian hard L. And it's actually even worse in Russian, I think, because that's even further back and a little bit uh, thicker. So here is an example of where it would be very important to uh, be careful of those L's and R's uh, that follow the A. Ah. So this is from Au Cimetière, from Les Nuits d'été by Berlioz. Un air maladivement tendre, à la fois charmant et fatal. 
and you can really see how we have all these nice bright eyes in there and they're not colored by anything that follows. Exactly. And also now we have an example of the bright ah that's spelled differently, of the O-I. Right. So the, the other spellings, as I mentioned, um, was the O-I spelling for the bright ah when O-I is not combined with N. And we can also have the O-Y when uh, this is also not followed by another vowel. And here um, is an example of this from Au bord de l'eau by Forêt. S'asseoir tous deux au bord du flot qui passe, le voir passer. And you can see how in s'asseoir and voir, we have that OI combination uh, that creates the bright A. Exactly. And we don't really expect to see the letters O or I come out as a bright phonetic A. For sure. And that's, again, that's one of the joys of uh, spellings in French. These uh, sounds on their own, O and E, we would say in French, have nothing to do with A, but somehow when you stick them together, they, they become A. Exactly. Are there any other spellings for the bright A? Yeah, there is one more set that we should probably talk about. Uh, if you see E-N-N -N or E-M-M, -M, uh, you can also have a bright A uh, sound coming from that. Um, this is maybe not as common, but it's actually also the spelling that you will find in a lot of a lot of um, adverbs in French. So it's it does it does happen, and it's it's good to uh, to note. Mm -hmm. And I have an example of this here from Ansourdine uh, in Fête Galante by Debussy. Et quand solennel le soir des chaînes noires tombera. So you see that e n n in solennel is not pronounced solennel or solennel. It's really a bright ha. And this is actually a nice little phrase that has most of our common spellings for the, the, the bright ha with the O-I and also the A on its own. Exactly. Uh, another one here from Sur les Lagunes from Les Nuits d'été by uh, Berlioz. Je n'aimerai jamais une femme autant qu'elle. And femme here has that E-M-M -M, uh, spelling that turns into a, a bright A. Ah. And these two words, solennel and femme, they come up pretty often in the repertoire. So these are just words to memorize and learn, right? Yeah, it's always good. There, 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 there are always some words that you will use all the time in poetry. Uh, and, and as you see them over and over, you'll, you'll tend to remember them. It's, it's, it's a good idea to, remember, to memorize them right away, probably. Exactly. But we do have to be careful with this E-N-N, E-M-M rule, because not every time that we see it will become the bright ah. Well, yes, because uh, like every rule, there are exceptions, right? Uh, so if you are not sure, you should really look this up in a dictionary. And here are two examples where these two spellings do something else entirely. Uh, from um, Avant de quitter ces lieux, from Faust by Gounod. J'irai chercher la gloire, la gloire au sein des ennemis, where the E-N-N -N, uh, turns into an open E instead of the bright A. And from Sur les lagunes, from Les Nuits d'été by uh, Berlioz again. L'ange qui l'emmena ne voulut pas me prendre, where the E-M-M -M turns into an A nasal this time. Exactly. The next vowel that we come to is the letter I. And one of the problems we have in talking about this is that the letter I is the phonetic lowercase i, which sounds like E. Yeah, it's always very confusing to talk about E and I in French because you never know if you're talking about the letter I or the sound E or... So we'll try and remain as clear as we can. Exactly. Um, now, the reason I like to go to E, the E sound right after our bright A, ah, is that uh, I like to focus on tongue vowel first. And uh, what you have to remember is that the only difference between bright A ah and E is the fronting of the tongue, meaning that we raise the back of the tongue as high as we can. The lips don't move and the shape of the mouth doesn't change. And the tip of the tongue is still touching the bottom teeth, uh, the bottom of the front teeth as it was for our bright A. Ah. So if we go from our A ah to E, it'll sound like this. Ai, ai. So when you say tongue vowels, what you're saying is that the movement and the shape of the tongue is what makes the vowel and, not, and the lips stay the same. Exactly. And it is also important to notice that E is very closed in French. So we really have to raise the tongue pretty high. Otherwise, what we'll get is a... 
uh, the um, capital I phonetically, the I sound that we have in English, but that is not a French sound at all. So you really have to make sure that you go for a real E sound. Yeah. So for E, or phonetic I, our spelling is maybe a little bit more straightforward than it was for A. We'll have uh, E sound when we see just the letter I, uh, the letter I with the two dots over it, the diéresis, uh, the letter I with a little hat over it, the accent circonflex, when these are not in combination with another letter. Um, also, when we have the letter Y on its own and not in combination, which is not as common, but it does happen, especially in the pronoun um, E, which means, means where as a pronoun. And uh, here are some examples of this, just to make things a little bit more clear. So from Fidilé by Duparc, repose au Fidilé midi sur les feuillages. And here we have both our I and Y spellings for the E sound. Our next example. This y, this y doesn't become a mixed vowel. It literally stays a pure E vowel. That's correct. This is a case where the Y is really just E and not U, like it would be in German, for instance. Exactly. Um, now, our second example is from Mandoline by Fauré. Et c'est d'amis qui pour mainte cruelle fit main vers tendre. So just straightforward cases of eyes on their own with uh, no combination and a nice closed E sound. And our last example, d'ici là-bas que de campagne, from absence, from nuidete by Berlioz. Same thing here, uh, I letters on their own, a nice closed E sound. Exactly. You had said that the I can also be spelled with the accent circonflex, the little, little hat on top of it, or the diéresis, which is the two dots, the umlaut marking. Do these accent marks change the pronunciation of the E sound at all? So, uh, no, the accent circonflex doesn't, but it can have a, a grammatical implication. For instance, uh, it will be the only difference between the simple past and the subjunctive past in France in the third person. Uh, like I, um, I'm showing here with il fi, which would be the simple past, and qu'il fi with the accent on it signifies that it's um, the uh, simple past of the subjunctive. Uh, the pronunciation is exactly the same, however, so it, you don't really have to worry about the accent circonflex over the I. Mm -hmm. The umlaut or the eresis or, you know, the, the two dots over the I indicate that the I does not function in a combination with the vowel that it's next to, and therefore it will, it will be pronounced E as a separate syllable of its own. Uh, a famous example of that is the title of Masnes Opera Thais, where we have two syllables because of the diéresis over the I. If you didn't have that there, uh, you would assume that the A and the I function in combination to create an open E, and you would say tes, but this is actually Thais because of the, the, two, the two dots. And actually just something I realized as we were talking about the accent circonflex, I remember an article recently that in French they were going to take the circonflex out of the language, but this probably doesn't affect us so much because most of what we're singing was written long, long ago and not since 2015 when they changed the rules, right? That's correct. There is, uh, there is a lot of talk right now about uh, a reform of uh, spelling in French and uh, getting rid of some of the overly complicated uh, spellings that don't really affect uh, pronunciation all that much. And uh, one of the big uh, subjects is that accent circonflex, which in a lot of cases doesn't really do anything other than indicate either a grammatical difference or um, the fact that there used to be another letter there. Uh, very often when you see an accent circonflex on a vowel, it means that in old French there used to be an S after that vowel that has become silent and um, eventually dropped over time. So there is talk of this, but it doesn't really affect our lyric diction. And uh, most of our texts that we use were written at a time where this reform would not have taken place. So we'll probably always see them with these, uh, these traditional spellings. Mm -hmm. So the next two vowels that we run into are the closed lowercase e and the open epsilon e. And just as I say closed lowercase e, that means not an e sound, but the letter e. <laughs> yes, I think maybe we can just call, call them closed e and open e, just to be clear. Okay. <laughs> we won't run into trouble. So um, all we have to do now is from our e position to lower the back of the tongue slightly to get to closed e. Again, nothing else changes. 
the lips remain the same and the tip of the tongue touches the bottom teeth and it will sound like this and if we keep lowering the tongue uh, we will eventually reach the open e now, closed A and uh, open A are really um, a closely related pair, and I think it makes sense to approach them at the same time. They are each other's close or open counterpart, and they actually share some common spellings. So this is actually where the, the fun actually uh, really begins. Um, <laughs> it is also important to note that closed A is a very closed vowel in French, um, pretty much like the long closed A in German. Uh, and definitely a little bit more closed than the closed day in Italian. And I think it's uh, it's helpful to think of it as on its way to E. And it's, uh, if you think of that closed E as very close to the E, you'll, you'll be in the right, uh, the right place. Exactly. As you, as you were doing the example, I could hear how your tongue stays almost in the same position from the E to the E, that it's, it's very high, it's very closed. Exactly. Yeah. So what then are the usual spellings for these sounds? All right, so we can have a bunch. <laughs> for closed E, we can have the E with the accent aigu, we can have AI, we can have ER uh, uh, when it's the, um, the mark of an infinitive verb. Um, ET is a good thing to remember, when it's, especially when it stands alone as uh, the word, uh, the conjunction end, that will always be a closed E. Um, easy when we conju conjugate uh, verbs also will be in closed A. Uh, when you have an E before a final consonant, uh, except an S or a T. And there are a few more cases that we don't want to clutter our slides with too much. Um, and for open A, we can have open A when we see the letter E with the accent grave, the letter E with the accent circumflex, the letter E with the two dots over it. Uh, when we see AI, when we see AI with the um, accent circumflex over the I. Um, EST, I think, is something that's important to remember because it's the third person plural of, uh, third person singular, sorry, of the verb to be and happens quite a bit, therefore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another thing to note is that a double consonant will often uh, open the closed, or, or open the letter E to an open E uh, instead of a closed A. And yes, uh, oops, sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I had learned from a friend of mine that the ET, since we talked about ET as a word by itself, meaning and, if we have ET at the end of a word, then it's generally open. That's correct. Uh, if ET is uh, used, if you see ET as within a word at the end, that's going to be an open E, but if you see ET on its own, meaning and, then it will be closed. Exactly. And also, this distinction between ET and EST is very important because this also carries through in Italian. The word and is the closed E, and the word for is is the open E. And even though the sounds are slightly different between the two languages, the rule stays the same. That's right. And it's exactly the same thing in French. So, uh, one important distinction about uh, closed E and open E uh, happens with, when we deal with uh, verbs and verb endings. So the AI ending in a verb will always be a closed A, and the AIS or AIT, or even more complicated AIENT, uh, will be an open E. Now it is important to get the correct sound in, in these cases because uh, it will usually signify a different tense. Now let's look at some examples here. Uh, here we have from Rencontre, from Poème d'un jour by Forêt. J'étais triste et pensif quand je t'ai rencontré. And here we can see that, that case where the AIS ending in the very beginning is open E and is the uh, imparfait tense in French, whereas the AI of je t'ai rencontré is a closed E, uh, and that's the passé composé in this case. Exactly. We also have the E with the accent aigu, which makes the vowels closed, the E vowel closed. Exactly, and we have an example of our ET that stands alone as end, and that's also a closed E, E pensif. Um, our second example for 
are A and E sounds from La Mer est plus belle by Debussy. Cette immensité n'a rien d'entêté. And you can see again here a few examples of the, the possible spellings for both sounds. And it's an, incidentally, the title itself, La Mer est plus belle, you have three nice open S in there in a row almost. Yeah. We, now we've mentioned the accents, and especially in this ep, this example, we get a lot of these accents. So why don't we take a second to talk about what each of them means, and when we say accent grave and accent circonflexe, what we're really talking about? Sure. So we call these accents diacritical marks, just to be technical for a second. Uh, and uh, we can have what we call the accent aigu, which is the one uh, that goes up to the right, and you'll find in a word like été or fidile. We can have the accent grave, which is the one uh, with uh, uh, that goes down to down to the right, uh, in a word like or a compound like lève toi. Uh, we can have the accent circonflex, which is a little hat, uh, which will uh, be in a word like frêle, for instance. Uh, and we can also have, and as we've seen already, uh, the two dots or diéresis, which in French we call tréma. Uh, and a word like Noël, the, the word for Christmas. Now, the tréma is not really an accent, and uh, it's there mostly to indicate that the, the letter E should be pronounced as a separate syllable, just like we saw with our letter I earlier. Uh, in this case, it will turn that syllable to an open E. Um, and it can sometimes also be seen in uh, uh, the, the compound G-U-E at the end of the word. If you see that tréma over the E at the end of a G-U-E, it just means that the, that syllable is pronounced gu and not g. Okay. How often does something like that come up? It's it's fairly rare, uh, but like if we look at the the slide here, uh, you know the first word uh, we use is accent aigu. Aigu means acute in French, uh, and if you were to use the feminine form of this, you would add the e there, but it would need that uh, little tréma to signify that it's not pronounced egg, but aigu, uh, even with the e at the end. It's it's fairly rare. Okay, great. And just so we know, there are we do in English say these words as the, the acute accent, the grave accent, the circumflex, you can say circumflex accent. And sometimes people call the, the diéresis an umlaut, but an umlaut really refers to something that changes the pronunciation of the vowel. So diéresis is technically the right word for this. That's correct. And you know, as, as long as you know which one is which in your mind, you can use whatever terminology, that's fine. <laughs> You just exactly. have, to remember, have to remember which direction they go in. Exactly. So basically the accent aigu, this acute accent, the one that goes up to the right, closes the vowel and all of the other accents will open it. That's correct. Now, one rule that I had somehow completely missed during my French diction classes, probably not because my teachers didn't say it, but because I wasn't paying attention, is that the E with the accent aigu, followed by a schwa in the next syllable becomes an open e. Eh. Yes, so that can be quite confusing and it, it tends to happen with uh, verbs like protéger where in the infinitive the closed e is followed by another closed e and in, the, in this case it just remains closed e, there's no issue. But when we conjugate uh, that verb, that initial closed e can be followed by a schwa uh, especially in the future. So, for instance, in the future tense, this would become protegera. So, in this case, the, the letter E that has the acute accent over it should be, cha should be changed to a letter E with the accent grave over it. But it's, it's not uncommon to see it spelled with the accent aigu still. Regardless of the spelling, what you should remember is that this will be pronounced with an open E protégera and not protégera and it, it's um, it's a small distinction but it's actually very important yeah um, we've talked about a few of these spellings we've had a few examples but why don't we have a few more just to highlight these differences because this distinction between closed e, e and open e is a really important one yes for sure uh, and before we get to these examples there's one more point I'd like to make um, Plural articles in French should all have an open E. 
the spoken language has migrated uh, toward uh, closed A for these little words. Um, and that's usually what you will find in modern dictionaries, because modern dictionaries preoccupy themselves with speech and not singing. Uh, but for lyric diction, I think these should really be open all the time, which um, gives them a little bit more space, a little bit more room, and makes them a better sound to sing. Now, here are some of uh, our additional examples for closed A and open A. So our first one from Chevaux de Bois, from Ariette Zoublier. Et dépêcher chevaux de la rame. So again, you can see some of our spellings we've talked about for the closed A and the open A. Mm -hmm. The second one we have here from Si mes vers avaient des ailes by Anne. Si mes vers avaient des ailes. Well, I just repeated that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they're all open here. They're all open. It's great. Like it gives you uh, a great sense of. Uh, commonality between all the vowels here. You, you're, you keep going back to that open S sound, which really helps with the sense of legato and line and, and evenness. So you should really make sure that you pronounce all these open S uh, the same. Our next example is from Peleas et Melisande. Vous n'avez jamais pénétré dans ces souterrains. Which I like a lot because it, it has the, the word pénétré in, in it, which has three closed A in a row, which you, you don't see too, too often. Exactly. Um, another one from Peleas et Melisande. Je t'ai fait mal ou t'ai-je fait mal? So this is interesting too because it shows us uh, the AI or AIT difference, uh, closed A, open A. But it also uh, goes back to our little rule about a closed E followed by a schwa will become an open E. So in the first line here, we have je t with a closed E. But when that same word t is followed by je with the schwa, it becomes uh, an open E. And this is very common when we have this inversion of the verb and the subject in questions in French. So où t'es je fais mal and not où t'es je fais mal. Exactly. And we get a lot of examples of this, more so I feel like in opera than in art song repertoire, because we talk more colloquially, so we tend to reverse the the je, the the sub the verb subject order sometimes. No verb yeah, subject verb order. Yes, because we uh, when you address uh, when you address your your counterparts, uh, there's more chances of actually having a question when there's a dialogue going on. Exactly. Now, we also have a lot of these examples in Carmen for some reason. <laughs> uh, here is one. Dans ma prison, m'était resté flétrie et sèche cette fleur. So a good, a good selection of close A, open A. Again, from Carmen in the card aria. La carte impitoyable répétera la mort. And here you really want to note that that second A with the accent aigu on it should be pronounced open A. And technically, it should be spelled with the accent grave, but you will see it spelled with uh, the accent aigu quite a bit. So be sure to sing répétera and not répétera. Exactly, because I know the score that I just played it out of had répétera written. Yes, and it's the same thing in here, uh, in this example from Carmen again. Non, je ne te céderai pas, je répéterai que je l'aime. Same idea, you, you open those, uh, those e, e letters with the uh, acute accent. Yeah. And our last Carmen example, mais j'ai beau faire la vaillante, with closed A, open A. So those were the tongue vowels. Why don't we move on to the lip vowels? And the first one is the dark A. Ah. Yes, so dark A ah is the more rounded version of our bright A. Ah. It's not very common in lyric diction, but it will be very important when we talk about nasal vowels in the next episode. So uh, we might as well uh, really make sure we get it right. Exactly. Is the is the dark ah the same as the English ah in father? It's close, but uh, rather than getting it rather than getting to it from uh, the English, uh, let's start again with our bright ah and see what uh, what we have to do from there. So from our bright ah. All we're going to do is round our lips very slightly to get to the dark A. Uh, uh, and since we were talk since we're talking about what you're calling lip vowels, this means that the tongue doesn't move for this, just the lips, right? 
That's correct. So the 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 tongue is not moving. Uh, the inside shape of the mouth of the mouth should remain the same, and um, it can really be uh, helpful to practice this in front of a mirror to make sure that nothing is moving inside. Now, in terms of uh, spellings, uh, there are a few possibilities for the dark a, uh, but the most important one I think to remember is the a, the a letter with the accent circumflex. In this case. Uh, the accent does not open the vowel, but it darkens it. The word for soul is am in French, uh, A-M-E with the accent circumflex, and it does come up quite a bit in poetry, so you really need to know that, uh, that letter and that sound well. Mm -hmm. And here we have an example of that from Claire de Lune by Forêt. Votre âme est un paysage choisi. And you can really hear how am is different from paysage or choisi. They're two different, really two different sounds. And it gives a nice color to, uh, to the word. Um, another one we can find is from Salut demeure chaste et pure in Faust by Gounod. D'une âme innocente et divine. Same idea. Yeah, it really does come up all the time. Yes, absolutely. So uh, technically we can have the dark A ah in other cases, like when you see uh, AS in the spelling or OIS. Uh, but most of the time, I recommend keeping these on the brighter side just to, um, to have a little bit more of uh, unity of your bright A vowels. Uh, but every once in a while, it can be interesting to, uh, to go to the dark A. Ah, and you will, you will find this in the IPA transcriptions from time to time as a sort of a, a choice of uh, an artistic choice, I would say. Mm -hmm. Here we have an example of where this could happen uh, from Dans un bois solitaire by Mozart. So, dans un bois solitaire et sombre. And you have the possibility of your dark A ah here, but depending on the voice and depending on how it sounds for a particular singer, I might advise for a bright A. Ah, dans un bois solitaire instead of bois. And did you just say Mozart? <laughs> I did, didn't I? Yes, that's... Uh, <laughs> Bad Frenchmen. Uh, <laughs> the French are terrible with foreign names, and we've we've uh, Frenchified all the all the name of most composers. Uh, so the, yeah, for me this is Mozart. Uh, I know it should be Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> so there are times when we can get a bright and a dark ah uh, back to back. Uh, yeah, it's not common, but it does happen. Uh, here we have an example from uh, the Melodie Populaire Grecque by Ravel, "La bas vers l'église." Now, how important is it that we make the distinction between the bright and the dark ah in a word like this? I, I think it's, it's uh, you know, I like to have as much variety as possible in your vowel sounds when you sing in French because that's, that's one of the main features of the language. Um, but it, it really depends on each individual voice and what it sounds like for each individual singer. So I think, uh, you know, if you thought that la ba keeping the same vowel would give you a better sense of legato than that's what you should do. Okay. So the next two vowel sounds we can look at together as well. Open, a, ah, and closed, o. Oh. Yes. So now from our dark, a, ah, if we keep rounding our lips more, uh, we'll end up to our open, a. Ah. Again, the tongue is not moving. Uh, and it is important to realize that French to, tends to use lips in a more active way than English. I think um, in English we tend to have what I call lazy lips. Um, however, we have to be careful to not create any tension with the rounding and to also not over project the lips forward. The French actually have a word for that. They say la bouche en cul de poule when we do this, which uh, translates roughly to uh, the mouth looking like a chicken's bottom. And this is, <laughs> you really overdo the rounding and you start sounding a little bit pretentious and too precious. And this is definitely not the way you want to speak or sing. Yeah, I think in English we would, we would talk about that as cat butt, but it, it, it's kind of, isn't that kind of what we as foreigners think French people sound like when they're speaking, that their lips are always out to swear a little bit? Uh, that's, that's probably, the, yeah, the, the common stereotype, but uh, <laughs> you probably stay away from that. So <laughs> from, uh, from our dark A, as I said, we first encounter our open A oh, with this rounding of the lips. And uh, it's important to remember that in French, open A oh, is very open kind of like the uh, open A ah in German. And therefore, it lives actually very close to our dark A. Ah. So if we go from our dark A, ah, ah, 
Uh, and if we keep rounding the lips, we'll get from our open O to our closed O. Again, the lips are not moving. Sorry, the tongue is not moving. Uh, and O is actually very closed and rounded in French, um, almost as much as in German. So if we start on our dark A, we'll have this uh, row of vowels. Uh, uh, now, we don't hear much of a difference between the dark A ah and the open A. Ah, but with the closed O, then you really hear a distinct difference. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's exactly right. And uh, here are some of the common spellings. Uh, for the open O, we can have that sound when you see a letter O followed by a sounded consonant, except if that uh, sounded consonant uh, is a phonetic Z. Or uh, when you have the combination AU before a pronounced phonetic R. And for our closed O, uh, we'll have that sound when you see uh, an O in a final position in a, in a word. Or O followed by uh, a silent consonant or the phonetic Z. An O with the accent circumflex. And the combinations AU and EAU. Um, the other thing that's actually helpful too to remember for this is that if you see O, the letter O in the final syllable in a word, it will always be closed. And um, I like rules where it says it will always be this or that because it doesn't happen too much in French. No, not at all. <laughs> Why don't we compare these with some examples? Great. So the first one I have here is from uh, Que fais-tu, Blanche Tourterelle, from, from Romeo et Juliette. Au vautour, il faut la bataille. So uh, three closed O's with that AU spelling we talked about. And notice that it's very closed. Au vautour, il faut la bataille. And my next example is from Le spectre de la rose from Les Nuits d'été by Berlioz. Je suis le spectre d'une rose que tu portais hier au bal. And here we have a case of our O followed by the phonetic Z and rose. Mm -hmm. an open A because it's a it's an O followed by a sounded consonant, sounded R, and then again an AU that turns into a O for O bal. Exactly. And um, just a side note on the rose, I always bring this up just because uh, I grew up in the south of France where uh, they tend to open that the vowel for for some reason in that word, and they they would say une rose. Uh, and you will hear that a lot. So depending on where you are, you also have to be careful with the uh, dialectal differences in the language. Now, the next example I have here is from uh, Claire de Lune, from Fête Galante by Debussy. Au calme Claire de Lune, triste et beau, qui fait rêver les oiseaux dans les arbres et sangloter d'extase les jets d'eau. So a lot of closed O's in here uh, with a lot of different spellings and one uh, open A and sangloté, and it's important to uh, make that distinction. Exactly, and this is, this is between the O's is where you add your 19th vowel, isn't it? Ah, yes, my 19th vowel. So um, at the beginning, I said that there are 18 vowels in French. Well, sometimes I like to add a 19th vowel, which I call the three-quarter O. Uh, there is no official IPA symbol for this, so I have been using a kind of an upside down C uh, symbol. And this sound is really between the open O and the closed O, and it can come in uh, handy mostly when we have two O syllables in a row. So the second one will be can be closed or open, but the first one, what you have to remember is that it won't be completely closed or completely open. So I know it sounds complicated, but with an example, it makes a little bit more sense. So here we have from Mandoline by Forêt, échange des propos fades. So our closed, the second O is a final O, and it's definitely a closed O, and we have to make sure it's really closed. But our first O, uh, I think, is neither closed nor open in a word like this. It's not propos, where they're both closed, and it's not propos, where the first one is open and the second one is closed. It's really in between. Propos. If we look this up in the dictionary, what would, what would that have listed for this first O? It would have a, an open O. It would say propos, which 
would not be wrong, but I think uh, in lyric diction, you can you can actually uh, be fancy and make that little distinction here. Yeah. Um, another word that happens a lot in poetry where this is helpful is uh, aurore. L'aurore va monter from Espoir by Chaminade, where the second O is open this time, but the first one, again, is neither closed nor open. It's, it's really in between. It's not aurore, it's not aurore, it's auror, and it's. I know it's it's slight, but uh, I think we we can actually do that. Now I admit that it's pretty finicky, uh, but we might as well be as refined as possible with French. And uh, maybe another way to think about this would be in the context of vocalic harmonization, and that's a, a, a topic that we'll approach in our fourth episode in the webinar series. And I really don't find this finicky because this is a rule that is regular across the languages. Any vowel in an unstressed syllable will be less open or closed than one in a stressed syllable. And a linguist would have all sorts of little markings to indicate the differences between vowels or consonants. But in lyric diction, we tend to use basic letters to indicate the vowel we're looking for, and then automatically adjust to these more unstressed syllables by ear. Yes, and uh, I would add that, you know, since French has so many uh, vowels already, there's so many shades within our symbols already that uh, our goal is to try and unify all, all these sounds uh, for the purposes of uh, line and legato. Yeah. It sounds like some of the same rules apply to O that apply to the E, like the fact that the double consonant after it seems to open it. Yes, so there are similarities. Uh, they both are pairs of open closed vowels. Uh, and as you said, double consonants will open them, as we can see here with the words uh, belle and moll. Uh, however, the accent circumflex will open the letter E while it will close the letter O. Rêve, drôle. So it's not quite the same effect. Um, and all of the, all the other accents, so the accent grave, the accent aigu, uh, the diéresis, uh, don't happen on O, and there are also many different uh, spellings that are specific for E and O in general. Yeah. So our last pure vowel is the U, the lowercase U. And this is a bit of an issue in French because we spell it O-U. Yeah, I guess, I guess it is an issue, uh, but it's, I think it's also the only possible spelling for U. Uh, and that's kind of nice uh, and simple and unusual for French. Uh, it can also be seen in combination with uh, sound vowels that make it look a little bit more complicated, but the basic spelling will always be OU. So if you see the word for August in French, OUT, or the verb uh, conjugated I will play, je jouerai, uh, what you have to focus on is that OU uh, spelling in here. Um, there can also be an accent circumflex over the U in that combination, but it will not affect the pronunciation. Uh, if you think of a word like goûter, it will just be a straight ou phonetically. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the lips for our ou sound are as rounded as for the closed o, but there's also a slightly different sense of a higher space inside the mouth. Uh, and it's a little bit trickier to, to get right. Um, I like to use one trick to find that vowel when it becomes tricky, and that is to imitate an L owl hooting, uh, and that will help us find the right space for, for the sound. So if you sort of go, ooh, ooh, then you'll have a, a sense for that, that uh, sound, for the ooh. Exactly. Well, one, and one of the problems that many Americans have is that in a lot of our dialects, that ooh sound has developed some form of tension, whether it's in the lips or in the tongue, so we can't really trust our Ooh, because oftentimes we would say ooh or ooh, something different. So it's important to make sure that when we're singing, we find that pure ooh in every language. Yes, and if, if you're in doubt, just ask yourself, what would an owl do? Ooh. So here are some examples of the uh, OU spelling uh, from Faust, the famous jewel song aria uh, from Gounod. Oh Dieu, que de bijoux, est-ce un rêve charmant qui m'éblouit ou si je veille? And that ou sound is particularly important here because the, the key word is bijou, the word for jewel, and it's, it's very highlighted in, in, the, in the rest of it, and it's very prominent, so you have to make sure you have that ou right. 
And then we actually also have uh, another U in there with uh, the name of the composer, Guno. Exactly. Well, we have that means we have four in this example, basically. Exactly. It's a good. It's a good practice. Uh, my next example is from uh, Manon by Massenet, from the famous aria "Adieu notre petite table." Adieu notre petite table, si grande pour nous cependant. And you have nice two nice U's in a row with "pour nous." Now we've gone through all of the pure vowels. Um, how to bring all of this information together? Are there any exercises we can do to work on to get all of these sounds to come out right? Uh, there are, but before we get to those, I need to stress the importance of keeping these all these vowels that we talked about today free of any diphthongs. Uh, there are no diphthongs in French, and it is very important to focus on the pure vowel sound at hand without letting it migrate to anything else. You really have to stay on that vowel that you're phonating at one particular time. Um, sometimes anticipating a consonant will give the impression of an involuntary diphthong, and that's always a big no-no. That's why it's so crucial to, to sing on the vowel as long as you possibly can, moving to the next thing a little, uh, as late as you can. This is also another reason that voice teachers and coaches ask their students to practice only on vowels. If you aren't saying the consonants, then it becomes much more obvious when you try to make a diphthong. That's correct. And uh, while you do that, you're, you're really trying to get to that feeling that you're late for the next syllable or the next pitch without actually being late. And if you get that sense that the vowels are as long as they can possibly be, then you'll be more likely to be on the right vowel for the right amount of time. And also, you'll have a better sense of legato. Yeah. Now, as far as exercises, uh, I think there is one uh, really helpful intoning exercise that we can do. And uh, what we do is we start on our bright A vowel, and we will first intone going through uh, our tongue vowels. So we'll start on A, bright A. We'll go to our E sound, our closed E, and our open E. And it will sound like this. I think this really helps uh, identifying how these sounds are related and uh, how little movement there is from one to the next. And the reason I like to go from A to E first is because that's uh, sort of the more obvious thing to feel is uh, you go from a, a tongue that's completely relaxed in the back to a tongue that's completely raised in the back. And from there, you can gradually lower it. I think it's easier to approach it that way and then uh, slowly uh, decrease the or lower the back of the tongue. Yeah, and can we go through the same thing with the lip vowels? Yes, we can do the exact same exercise moving through our lip vowels. Uh, which means we, we will gradually round our lips uh, as we go through the row here. Uh, and uh, I really recommend doing this in front of a mirror to make sure that we don't move any of the articulators that should not be involved and that we also don't overdo the, the lip rounding. Um, it can be very interesting to see how relaxed, how relaxed the lips can be while still intoning on a, a, a nice round O or an O. I don't have to have a lot of uh, lip tension in, in there. Exactly. We're towards the end of our hour today, and we did have one question on the Facebook page that came through. They were asking about the closed E sound and how we can sing that because when we say it, it is such a closed sound and it feels like it blocks off a lot of the space. How do we sing that, making it sound like an E but not block our voice? Well, what's important, I think, is, is to uh, distinguish between what the tongue is doing and the overall space that we create in the back of the mouth. Uh, just because we have the tongue raised doesn't mean that we lose the sense of lift. Uh, and as long as you feel like that space is uh, really there and that your soft palate is, is raised and uh, everything is open in the back, the, the motion of the tongue is, is not really going to impede that. So you want to make sure that you keep uh, the sense of the overall space in the mouth while the tongue is doing all these, uh, all these motions in there. 
And we're actually out of time for today. For anybody who has any other questions, please feel free to write us at the Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash the diction, uh, slash diction police, <laughs> or to write to me directly. You can find any of our email addresses online. Thank you, Francois, very much for being here. My pleasure. And thank everyone for joining us today at the Diction Police by the Book. For anybody who has any other questions, please feel free to write to us. In the next lesson, we'll be continuing with the rest of the vowels, focusing on mixed vowels, nasal vowels, semi-vowels, and everyone's favorite subject, the French schwa. In the meantime, for more ways to work on your diction, make sure to check out the Diction Police Facebook page for our Tongue Twisters for Singers series, diction tips, and diction lessons. See you next time. Thank you.